Hi, and welcome back to the History Hut. I'm Jim. This is Dr. K, and we're about to wrap up our discussion on Charlemagne and the Carolingians, and we're talking about the army and the cavalry. Uh, how successful were they in protecting the empire? I don't think you like me. You're always trying to wrap up on my discussions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, come on, a historian. It never wraps up until, like, yesterday. Right? So, yeah, yeah, well, you know. yeah. Okay, so you've got this great cavalry. You're, you're scared of the present. <laughs> I know. That's why you became a historian. I know. It's like, no, don't tell me what's happening now. It's freaky. <laughs> it's freaky. So um, you have you have the, um, you've got the cavalry, you've got your knights, you've got your infantry. You're like all tooled up. You're ready to fight anybody. Does it work? Well, no, it doesn't really <laughs> work at all. I mean, it works as far as, as going in and invading other territories. You know, it works for his expansion policies but over the long haul no and it's not really the Carolingian system that's at fault because that seems to me to be a pretty sensible way of both protecting yourself and expanding Absolutely. your territory you have cavalry that really can't be defeated for you know maybe until I mean they're still using cavalry charges in World War One and thinking that's the the way that you're going to win the war the problem is if the people coming into your territory aren't on horses or on foot how else could they be coming in? Can you think? See? Row, 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 <laughs> row, row <laughs> gently down the stream. Uh, yeah, uh, if they're coming in in another way, <laughs> then your mm. horses and your 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 knights with their 60 pounds worth of armor that has to be stuck on them and your infantry, not going to be all that helpful. That's and that's exactly what happens. When um, the, there's the first set of attackers that, that kind of hit the Carolingians are the Magyar raiders, and they come in from the Hungarian plains super fast. We're talking, you know, Mongol fast again, and, and they're just not, again, you know, get all your armor on, get all your stuff, get organized, and they've already been through your mob and they've left, and you're like, who were those, <laughs> who are those strange people? So they're swift horsemen from the Hungarian plains. And then you get the Viking raids of the 9th and 10th centuries, and the Carolingian system just takes too long to get tooled up to respond. So just, you know, the Vikings have incredible speed and maneuverability as well uh, by sea and by river. Not only can they go across the big the big dark ocean, but they can up and down any river system anywhere, anytime. So they have really shallow drafts on their longboats. They can go, you know, they're up the Seine, they're up the Thames, they're, you know, they're down the right, any any river system you could name, they've already been on it, you know, and gone, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I know where I am now. So the object of the Magyars and the Vikings was to loot. So they simply avoided areas where they thought there would be concentrations of Frankish cavalry. And of course, the Frankish infantry was always too slow to respond. And people had already been plundered and raped and pillaged before anybody knew what was going on. And they'd be like, and where are these people that did this to you? And be like, I see that sail off in the <laughs> distance? Yeah, there they are. So... The Vikings arrive by, by river, they plunder, they pillage, they rape, they leave before the, the, the Frankish uh, guys even dress for battle. And uh, in the meantime, the next response to this, of course, is a wave of castle building. So if you can't if you can't get your guys ready, the least you can do is build a castle, and then when the raiders come, all the local people, I'm sure you've seen lots of daft pictures, but you know movies about. Monty Python stuff, you know, where the, all the, the horrible stinky peasants all run like crazy inside the castle and then the, the gate comes down, the moat goes up and then you just sit there hoping that they don't know where you are. I wonder <laughs> where all the people went. I don't know. There's a big there's a big stone thing there, but uh, I don't know what's in that. So uh, it was, it's, the castle building is just a delaying tactic, really, until everybody can get ready to go out. But usually the Vikings had left by then. Uh, but this again meant that people started to look to the local lords for protection, right? It's not the king and his cavalry that's protecting them. It's the local lords um, that are protecting them. And so um, you, you have, again, this parallel source of power re-emerging. Hmm. And you can see, especially in Britain, when you get the Viking attacks on Britain, you can see there's waves of, of castle building. And not your pretty castles, but the castles like, mm -hmm. with with the tiny, tiny openings, just big enough to put your bow and arrow in, you know, so they can't see you, but you can you can see them and fire at them. 
So what is uh, what is Charlemagne's legacy? Uh, at the end of the day, what's what what are we left with? At the end of the at day. The of the day. Oh, yeah. well, at the end of the day. Well, uh, I mean, I think the Carolingian Empire is, a, is a, a really important transition period between the end of Rome and the emergence of what will become the new Europe, the new European order. Uh, Christianity maintains its firm hold on Western Europe thanks to the Roman Empire, and then because it's one of the few things that bridges the Roman Empire and the new Europe. And of course, the fact that Charlemagne is so reliant on the church really helps us along. And we talked about Clovis just having these mass baptisms. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you can do that, but it's the Irish monks and the other monks moving around through that 300-year period that, that really you know start to translate Bibles into the vernacular, start to speak to people in their own languages, make the, the faith understandable. So Christianity... Uh, really, you know, maintains its its hold. Uh, Latin remains the language of the court and the language of diplomacy from this point for maybe another four or five hundred years at least. So everything, uh, more or less, in Latin. And uh, there's this great awareness, thanks to the Carolingian Renaissance, of the need to preserve the Roman heritage. So uh, the Carolingian Renaissance, huge impact. Uh, there's a single coinage established throughout Europe. There's a legacy of record keeping, thanks to Alcuin of York and the, you know, the, the Bank of Scholars. So especially uh, keeping legal documents in the capillaria, the government uh, proclamations. And this great love of learning is, is kind of re-established um, um, a lot of so there's a lot of state support for gaining knowledge, for educating young men, for whether it's for the priesthood or to uh, be part of the, the government bureaucracy, it doesn't matter. So a great respect for knowledge and for learning and, of course, the importance of education. Uh, and, of course, it's not for everybody, right? <laughs> education, it's not for everyone. Yeah, there's a good catchphrase. It's a, it's a good university <laughs> motto. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, it's not for everyone. <laughs> so it's, it's for the elite, of course, uh, in this period. Um, so all those kinds of things are, are important. You know, the Merovingians almost get it right. You know, they have the counts, they have the military adaptable stuff, but, you know, they, they just quite don't quite get it. And, and Charlemagne um, has problems as well. You know, he tried to separate the kingdom between his mm -hmm. three sons. It's not his fault two of them died. Um, so just out of interest then, um, just about Charlemagne himself. So he makes good political marriages for his sons. And as I mentioned before, he kept his daughters unmarried and at court as his advisory team. But uh, he allowed them to keep their lovers at court with them. What a nice dad. So they could have men, but they just couldn't marry them and leave. But it, that's because they fulfilled this function. They were jointly mm -hmm. the queen, so they act as the queen together. So that's kind of neat. Uh, in 806, he decided what each of his legitimate sons would receive when he died. So that's, you know, good. You're thinking ahead. Okay, I'm going to divide up the empire so everybody knows, and then you can all make your is, decisions. Is that the start of the will? <laughs> you'll, who, you'll, yeah, <laughs> who you'll back up. Uh, so Surprise he names, it's not called the Charles. <laughs> he names, <laughs> yeah, here, <laughs> what have you written in your Charlemagne? Um, so he named his heirs, but two of the three heirs die before he does. So that's a bit of a blow. Mm. So in the end, the empire isn't split up, which is good. <laughs> but right. but uh, it wasn't actually you know, his plan. Uh, so the main heir was supposed to be Charles. The core of the empire would go to uh, his son Charles. So from the Loire to the Rhine, and that would include Neustria and Austrasia and all the monasteries within that territory. Pepin was to get Italy, Bavaria, and southern Alemannia, which would be you know, German territory. And Louis uh, was to get Aquitaine, Provence, and Burgundy. But Charles is the main heir, and he doesn't actually like Louis all that much. I mean, he gets on with them, but he's not like, well, he's not my favorite or anything. And Charlemagne also said, and I think this is very interesting, um, Charlemagne also said that if any of the three sons died, then the empire should be divided amongst the, the two remaining sons, the two brothers. And he felt compelled to say that none of his grandsons were to be killed, blinded, or mutilated without a trial. So if any of the uncles thought, well, you know, this, is, this might go to his son, uh, I'll just kill him, that wasn't to happen. Uh, they were to be respected by their fathers and their uncles. So, you know, a little bit mm. of foresight, you know, a bit of thinking ahead. Uh, I don't know about my sons, you know, they might be murderers, who knows? <laughs> so he actually tries to establish an orderly succession, and that's good. But Charles dies in 811 of a stroke 
stroke while he's on campaign in Bavaria. Uh, Pepin dies in 810 of a fever after a six-month siege of Venice. So it's only Louis that's left. And uh, Charles, you know, not terribly keen on him as the as the heir, but acknowledged him as his primary heir. And then actually crowned him co-emperor in 813 and ruled with him. So he gets a bit oh. of practice. And then, bit uh, of practice. Yeah, that practice, you know, bit of practice. And, and then Charlemagne got a fever. Um, the, you did the usual kind of religious thing, fasted and died in January of, of 814. And there's a wonderful uh, historian, Rosamund McKitterick. She has a lot of work on the Carolingians. Really good to have a read through her uh, stuff on Charlemagne. Now, the other, um, other just kind of odd information. Um, when Otto was crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 996 AD, he wanted to both celebrate his new status and to celebrate the upcoming millennium. You know, oh. it's like, ooh, a lot of people thought it was going to be the end of the world and, you know, the whole world would be destroyed. Why 1K? Yeah, why 1K? You know, people went into St. Peter's in Rome and they'd given away all their property and they were wearing sackcloth and ashes and they were like, oh, we're all going to die. Then the next morning, everything was still there and they'd given mm. away all their stuff. Mm. So, you know, not, not, <laughs> yeah, not good at all. <laughs> it's like, um, you know that thing I gave you yesterday, my Charlemagne? I mean, my will. Uh, can I have that back, please? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, to celebrate the upcoming millennium, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, Otto, went to Aachen, you know, where Charlemagne had his court and was, was, was dead and had mm -hmm. died, right? Yeah. And he ordered the sealed crypt of Charlemagne opened. Now, this is when the miracles begin, right? Because... They, they open the crypt and it smells all musty, you know, of course, as it would. And Otto said a wee prayer, as you would, before going in. And then he looked in and he saw Charlemagne sitting upright on his throne with a golden crown on his, uh, on his head and his hand, one hand on his sword, one hand in my pocket, <laughs> one hand his sword, and the, in the other hand he held the scepter and the orb and on his lap a jewel-encrusted illuminated manuscript. And he's like, ooh. And he had white gloves on. <laughs> he had white gloves on, but the nails had gone, grown through the gloves. Oh, like, ah, you know. So Otto said that the body hadn't decomposed except for the tip of his nose. So he had a little gold tip made to replace the tip of his nose. So obviously only saints' bodies don't decompose. Everybody else's decomposes. So he has a, a replacement gold tip put on his nose. And then he had Charlemagne's nails cut, which is quite nice. <laughs> and, they, and then they put new linens on the corpse, and it still didn't collapse in a crumpled heap uh, and then he pulled at the last minute he's like you know I think I'd like a holy relic I think I'd like a relic from this guy pulled a tooth out so pulled one of Charlemagne's teeth out and took the gold cross from round his neck and uh, resealed the crypt. And then people said, oh, you're going to have really bad luck. You know, you shouldn't be tampering with dead bodies. That's not good. Um, and nothing really happens at first. And then, of course, within a few years, oh, it all comes home to roost. Uh, things start to go wrong. And <laughs> the things, I mean, this is typical, right? It's not like a specific thing. Oh, my God, this happened to him. It's like suddenly Otto lost his will to live. <laughs> oh yeah so like he had a bad day you know three yeah. years after this uh, then he became depressed and then he started to fast and pray prayed a lot and he was like oh i don't know what's going on i just you know and his, his pals took him out and they besieged a couple of cities but even that didn't cheer him up you know they're like oh he's so depressed this must be because of that charlemagne thing um and then he went on a few pilgrimages you know he did a couple of penances and he's like i just you know i'm just so sad all the time uh, and then he caught a cold. Well, of course, that would have been the thing that did it. And soon after he caught the cold, he was covered in abscesses and rashes, and he thought he'd been poisoned. And so he dies at the tender age of about 22 with no heirs. People are like, that's what you get for going mm. into a dead guy's crypt. You and know, that's, you don't mess with dead bodies, and you certainly don't take their teeth away. What do you think? You're the tooth fairy? No. <laughs> so... Uh, Charlemagne, after after this, uh, the the next piece, uh, the next time there's interest in him is in 1165. Emperor Frederick Barbarossa uh, had the the crypt reopened again in 1165, and Charlemagne at that point was canonized, the first step towards sainthood. So Barbarossa put the body into a, a they had made this beautiful gold bust, a reliquary, um, and they they put the what was left of the body, obviously not a huge body anymore, uh, put that into the, the gold bust and uh, it remained at Aachen. Now, um, it was removed to Paris by Napoleon 
you know, when Napoleon, after the French Revolution, Napoleon declared himself emperor in 1804. And so he saw himself as the new Charlemagne. So he, he brought that bust to Paris and it wasn't returned until uh, to Aachen until after the defeat of Napoleon um, in 1815. So mm. it went back to Aachen and there's no access, no public access to it uh, all the way. Well, I think there might have been some access in the early 1800s, you know, after it went back to Aachen, but no public access to the rest of the world till 1979. And then the first time it was displayed in public was in uh, 1998 at the Charlemagne exhibit in Cologne or Köln now and also the pre-Charlemagne was created for anyone promoting economic unity in uh, Europe or you know European unity and economics as part of that and so just a little thing from the economist from September 4th, 2010, Charlemagne, long live the Carlings. The Emperor Charlemagne, it says, is the wrong father figure for Europe. And so it just starts off. It's got, uh, um, it would be Cameron and Merkel and Sarkozy uh, in the picture. They've all got wee swords. It says, beyond the octagon of the Aachen Cathedral lies the golden shrine of St. Mary, holding ancient relics that are displayed every seven years. And it goes on. Aachen is one of the great pilgrimage sites of medieval Europe. Uh, in these more sceptical times, it's, it is the other golden casket here that commands the visitor's attention, the one bearing the remains of Charlemagne, the Frankish warrior king, crowned as heir of the Roman Empire by Pope Leo in 800, still revered locally as a saint. More importantly, he's the icon of Europe's newer secular faith, political and economic integration. Since 1950, Aachen has bestowed um, the yearly Charlemagne Prize on the figure deemed to have done the most to promote European unity. And um, then it just says Charlemagne's empire was ephemeral. The partition um, in, engendered by his grandson's civil war proved more lasting. Louis the German took the lands east of the Rhine that would one day become Germany. Charles the Bald got the western lands uh, and the core of the future France and the elder Lothair got the middle bit destined to be fought over endlessly. Aachen at the heart of the empire became a frontier town known as Aix-la-Chapelle in, Fran in French. It changed hands between Napoleon and the Prussians. In the Second World War it was the first German city to fall to the Allies and much of it was reduced to rubble, although the damaged cathedral survived. Charlemagne's remains were taken to a coal mine for safekeeping. <laughs> and then it just goes on to talk. It says for, uh, Charlemagne is a more palatable figure than some of the European empire builders that followed him, like Napoleon, Hitler, or Stalin. Like Abraham, he is supranational, the forebear of both the French and the Germans. By remembering the man Germans called Karl de Gross, perhaps Europeans can overcome their bitterness at the Kaiser and the Fuhrer. And then it just you know talks about goes on to talk a little bit about Aachen. So Charlemagne, never out of the news. Yeah, there you well. go. <laughs> Dead and, but not forgotten. And now forever on YouTube. That's right. Forever <laughs> on YouTube. So that wraps up our discussion on Charlemagne and the Carolingians. It certainly does. Join us next time for some more historical goodness. Which one of us is going to lock the history hut after this? Oh, I, you better. You know, it's cold out there, so we better. Yeah. Okay, I'll lock it. Right. Bye. <laughs>